It is a real privilege and a pleasure to be here with you at the Charles Hotel and to be introduced my, by my friend, Noel Anderson. And uh, just to say that uh, the work you do, uh, as I've learned about it, largely through Noel, is just so critical uh, to this country and where we are right now. And uh, when I got the invitation to ask me to, to speak tonight, I readily accepted, even though it meant I had to fly from Chicago, <laughs> Uh, where I spoke earlier today, uh, to be here. Um, but I, I felt this was important, because what you do is important. And <clears throat> coming to the Charles Hotel, uh, because as you heard, I, I taught at Harvard for uh, three years, uh, brings up lots of, of memories, uh, good memories. Uh, when I was recruited to come to Harvard, Harvard really knows how to recruit a person, I'll tell you. They, they throw out a red carpet. Right? They, uh, not only did they give me and my family, two rooms here. They had itineraries for me and not only my wife, but my kids, they had itineraries too. All the things they were gonna do, the days we were here as we were being courted to come to Harvard. And uh, the question they said to us, the question they asked me is, what will it take to get you to come here? <laughs> so, okay, well, I like that question. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, they, they they then explained to me, they said, you know, to come to a place like this, as a full professor, an endowed chair, we have to go to the Preston University and say, this is the best person in the world available at this time. So I said, wow, me? Really? <laughs> so they talk about being hyped up. Now, <clears throat> let me put this in context. I come from, I was born in Harlem. Grew up in Brownsville, in building houses. <laughs> okay, my family's from the project. Neither of my parents graduated from high school. So to end up here is uh, quite a story. And that's a story Americans love. Don't we, we love that, that rags to riches story? The Andrew Carnegie story, the Bill Clinton story, the Barack Obama story. It's a story we love, it's a story we celebrate, but guess what? I knew it way back then. We are the exceptions. There are lots and lots of other folks out there who also have talent, but didn't have opportunity. And what drives me, and what I think drives this organization, is the understanding that there are lots and lots of other people out there who are talented, with gifts, and with promise, but who simply have not had the chance. And that's why the work you do is so important. Because we know the American dream is really just a dream for lots of people. And it's not simply a matter of how hard you work. I realized that I, I, I worked hard since I was 12. I explained, I come from a family where if you wanted nice sneakers, then it was like, okay, well, go get them. <laughs> right? Go get a job. <laughs> Otherwise, they can do the pay less. <laughs> and uh, so I always worked. And uh, the, after my freshman year at Brown, I decided, I, I was told that I could get a job at a bakery in, um, in, in Rhode Island and, uh, and not far from Providence. <clears throat> and it was at the time paying four fifty an hour, which was great, which was more than minimum wage. So I readily accepted, but it meant I had to be there at five in the morning. I meant I had to get up at four in the morning to get there. And it's the hardest job I've ever had. It was so hard that I would sleep on my break. And I remember uh, there was a, a guy who was a Greek immigrant who was our boss, because there was a few brown students who were working there together, and he was the one who was kind of directing us in our work. And he would say, he would show us how to mop, how to sweep, and he said, no, not like that, like this. Much more, you know, energy, much more vigor into it. And I'm looking at this guy. The guy had only three fingers on one hand. We lost two of them at that place. There was no question this man was an extremely hard worker. Long hours he put in. And then I found out he only made about $8,000 an hour. There is a myth in America. The myth is that the people who don't have don't work hard. Some of the hardest working people in America are people who are stuck in poverty. It's not hard work that keeps them poor, it's lack of opportunity. And what we've got to do is 
find a way to change that equation. I was uh, just in a conversation the other day with the former CEO of Newsweek, who now runs the foundation, Rick Smith. And he asked me, he said, are you optimistic about the country? And elsewhere I've written, uh, I, call, I describe myself as a pragmatic optimist. This almost sounds like an oxymoron, but uh, I can't help but being a pragmatist from my life experiences. But I, I think by nature I'm an optimist. I like to see the price, I like to see the potential. And I said, you know, the only place where I see optimism is in some communities at the local level and in civil society. Not in government. The government is broken. It can't solve problems. It actually contributes to our problems. Um, and uh, we have huge, growing, looming problems. But at the local level, every once in a while, at the level of civil society, when I see nonprofits, business sector, and sometimes local government come together to solve problems, I see great potential. I was invited to go to Kalamazoo, Michigan uh, a few months ago. They have something called the Kalamazoo Promise there, where a few philanthropists have donated uh, large sums of money to guarantee that any student who graduates from Kalamazoo will get a full scholarship for college. Very impressive, except they realize, you know what, they're losing too, way too many kids. They're not graduating enough kids to even take advantage of that opportunity. They asked me to come in and help them figure out, okay, how do we create a pipeline to a scholarship that's waiting for these kids? Before I came, we said, well, we've got to make sure that in the room, you have all the people from local government, all the people from the churches, all the people from the school system, from the private sector, they all have to be in the room. I said, why? I said, because they all have to be part of building that support system, building that pipeline. You know what's wrong? Right now, we pretend that schools can solve the problem of inequality in America. And we have ample evidence they can. Ample evidence they can. In fact, more often than not, schools are implicated in the reproduction of inequality. <clears throat> What's the strongest predictor of how well a student will do in school? How well they do on the SAT? How well they'll do in college? It's family income. And when you combine family income with how much education the mother has, you can predict how well a student will do in school to a large degree. That's a major indictment of our belief in education, isn't it? Because what it suggests is there are lots of people out there who are hoping for education to be there to take it out, but whom it's not. And it's not really the school's fault. Because schools can't solve the problem of inequality by themselves. Why would we think that could be possible? Throughout this country, we consistently spend the least money on the schools that educate the neediest kids, and the most money on the schools that serve the most privileged kids. And the only people who say that money doesn't matter are people who have lots of money. <laughs> <Ever know? laughs> And so we have schools that are serving kids that are coming to school hungry. And guess what? Hungry kids don't do so well. And we've got kids who are distracted because their family is lost housing or the parent lost a job. And guess what? They don't do as well either. So many of the social issues impact learning. But we tend to ignore that. And we put so much faith and so much hope on education. And then what do we do? We blame the schools. We're not solving the problem. Meanwhile, the rest of our society is doing very, very little to help. And so consequently, rather than our school being the great equalizer of opportunity, that's the, the slogan, that's the term that Horace Mann used when he called for public schools here in Massachusetts, the first public schools, that we needed public schools to be the equalizer of opportunity. If you think about it, education has always been seen as integral to the American dream. But that can only work if schools get lots more help than they do. But we tend not to see this bigger picture. Those of you who watch the NBA playoffs like I do probably saw this commercial. This commercial with Brian James is on it. It's about a dropout in school. Kid is on the bed and 
the alarm bell sounds, and instead of getting up, he goes back to sleep, and then it, it shows he drops through the floor. And before you know it, he's in a homeless shelter. And then he wakes up and realizes it's a dream, and he runs off to school. And LeBron is there smiling, like, that's right, kid. <laughs> Go to school, you'll be like me and make millions of dollars. This is, you know, LeBron did a lot in school. <laughs> There's a lot that's wrong with that commercial. <laughs> One thing that's wrong is the assumption that the kids who are dropping out drop out because they're too lazy to go to school. I had a, a student of mine, he was, uh, I do a teacher course at NYU. One of the things that students have to do, they have to research in schools designed to help schools. So this graduate student was also an assistant, uh, assistant principal. So he wanted to study uh, chronic choice understand why they weren't coming to school. I said, it's a great project. The only problem is the kids that you want to study don't come to school, so you have to track them down. <laughs> I'm sorry about it. So I'm going to track them down. So he starts to track them down. He's calling, he's doing all the hard work to find out. And what he just learns from tracking down these chronic students, the chronic students, is that they're not coming to school because they're at home sleeping or at home watching TV. Most of them are at home because they're taking care of siblings, they're taking care of older relatives, they're working nights, they can't get the subway fare to get to school. That is what he realized, in this school, they really want to get kids to come right and need a case manager. Someone can help these kids solve some problems in their lives that are so big that they can't even get to school on a regular basis. Not a true norm. If you think the problem is lazy kids, then how do you look at the issue of dropouts? You think the problem is, guess what? Some kids have issues in their lives that are so difficult, so complex, that they can't get to school, then you respond differently. Too often in our policy world, we focus on symptoms of problems, not the underlying causes. And anybody knows about health knows that if you focus on symptoms, not causes, you often make the problem worse. And I would say in education, we don't really address underlying causes. What makes Europe work, and what make it, could make it work even better, is if you can help young people to develop the ability to have some social capital. And I talked to some young people here, it sounds like that's happening for them. They're learning how to network, they're learning how to take advantage of opportunities, because guess what? When you grow up in a community like I grew up in, you don't get those skills. Because you don't have that exposure, you don't have those contacts. It doesn't come naturally when you live in the housing projects. And if someone's not there to open the door and explain to you, this is how the system works, this is where you go, this is how you present yourself, when you go to an interview, this is how you should dress. If someone doesn't break it down, guess what? Opportunity denied, and it has nothing to do with talent or desire. It's everything to do with how the system works and the ways opportunities get denied. So Europe is playing a critical role of trying to change the course of the country. And it's clearly it's a small role because we've got a big country. And the number of disconnected youth out there is actually growing. Arnie Duncan likes to talk about the, the 5,000 dropout factories in the country. I say problem's actually worse than that. The failing high school is a failing middle school feeding right into it, and a failing elementary school right behind it. The systemic system of failure, not just a few high schools. But we have the ability to solve this problem. I really believe that. And I believe that based on my own experience. When I was a graduate student at Berkeley, I was approached by the mayor of Berkeley to become her chief of staff. And because I was only 26 at the time, I thought that was a great idea. <laughs> and as her chief of staff, I was responsible for dealing with all the big problems facing Berkeley at the time. Homelessness, drug trafficking, housing issues. I was, it was all my, and I loved that. I said, okay, I'm going to solve these problems. So after a few months in the job, I started to realize I'm not solving any problems here. But I am the person who gets blamed. <laughs> Drive by shooting out the community. I'd go out to see what happened to people yelling at me. I said, Wait, I didn't shoot anybody. <laughs> I 
Well, why aren't the police here? I said, that's a good question. <laughs> so after a few months of that, I started getting tired. Said, this is not really working. I better go back to grad school and finish up. <laughs> I was approached by a, a friend of mine who was an administrator in the local public schools. And this is a person who had a reputation as an advocate for kids who were not well served. And because of his advocacy, he'd run into a conflict with the superintendent. So to punish him, she decided she was going to make him the principal of the alternative school, school for the bad kids. She thought that would force him into early retirement. He was already in the 60s. But instead of being moved to retire, he gets rejuvenated. He comes to see me, he says, Pedro, I'm so excited about my new job. I said, really? I'm excited. He says, if he brings one of his students, he says, I want you to meet John and convince John to run for student body president of my school. I'd been the student body president at Berkeley, and he thought I could somehow convince him. I'd never met John, but I took one look and I realized this is not typically presidential material. <laughs> John had thick gold chains around his neck, gold teeth in his mouth, gold rings on every finger. And I figured anybody with that much gold. How to do something illegal. <laughs> and I'm wondering why does he want John to be the president of the school? But I trust my friend George Perrin. I start to talk to this young man for a few minutes. It's clear that John is very intelligent. He's a charismatic individual. He's going to run the school either way. <laughs> and the principal is wise enough to realize that he needs John on his side, not against him. <laughs> So I'm so taken by his ability and his willingness to work with the students, so taken by the potential that I too see in John, and I say, well, I want to visit the school. I didn't know we had this alternative school. And Berkeley will come, come tomorrow, come and see. Now what you should know is that Berkeley is one of the first communities in the country to voluntarily integrate schools. But when I get there, I find a school that's completely segregated. And in fact, when you get there, you can't tell it's a school at all because most of the kids are in the parking lot. Their cars and they're hanging out and they're smoking, and not all of them are smoking cigarettes. And there's no more than two or three kids in the classroom. And I'm walking through the halls and I say, Wow, this is fairly seems like a school. And I ask the teacher, What's it like to work here? Fine, no problem. <laughs> you don't bother them, they don't bother us. Everybody gets along. I go back to see my friend George. I said, George, you got a big problem. He said, really, I only have two problems. I said, just two? He said, just two. I said, what's that? He said, the teachers and the kids. <laughs> said, well, those are two big ones. He said, well, I can do something about the teachers. I said, you can? He said, yeah. He said, I'm just going to demand that they bring a lesson plan every single day. He said, that's going to work? He said, it's going to make them teach. He said, but I don't know what to do about the kids. Can you help me with that? I said, well, let me try. So I decided to go out in the parking lot and spend some time talking to kids, find out who they were, why they came. And the first thing I learned about them surprised me. All of these kids were over 16, past the legal age at which you can drop out. They all were old enough to stop going where they were coming. Weren't going to class, weren't necessarily doing the work, but they were coming to school. They were coming to school because they hadn't given up on themselves. They still had dreams, they had aspirations, they had goals. No idea of how to achieve those goals, but they hadn't given up on themselves yet. They also had an overriding concern about their survival. As many of them were turning 17, 18 years old, and they knew that soon they would be out of their parents' homes, they would be on their own, some of them were supporting children already, and they had to figure out how to make some money. I came back to George, I said, George, we've got to figure out how to show these kids that they can use their education to make some money. I said, well, how do we do that? I said, well, I have an idea. Because I'd been in the mayor's office, I knew a company that was in negotiations with the city, Bayer Laboratories. Bayer Laboratories is a large German biotech firm that was negotiating with the city over its rights to expand operations, to develop a large portion of product property. So the city was requiring certain mitigations back from the company. And I had been in those negotiations where I worked in the mayor's office, so I decided I would go do an end run around the mayor, right to the CEO. I said, why don't you create a biotech academy for our school? And because it's a German company, 
And in Germany, they use technical education as a way to build pathways into technical fields. He said, well, this makes a lot of sense to me because we have trouble attracting entry-level employees. An entry-level employee in biotech at that time made $14 an hour. That was in 1988. So we commenced with developing this biotech academy. To be in the academy, you had to take four years of science and four years of math. But they thought, that's unheard of. These kids can't do that. But we built in summer jobs. We built in internships. We showed them that by doing this, there was a real pathway to some opportunities. It's amazing what happens when you put some of these kids in a white coat and some goggles. Some start to really think they're engineers and technicians. <laughs> it took us three years, three years to take a school that had been a dumping ground for bad teachers and presumably bad kids to turn it into a school that was a genuine alternative. Sixteen years later, that biotech academy now serves seven high schools, five community colleges, and two four-year schools. What do we suffer from in America? We suffer from lack of imagination. We are a rich country even now. With lots of wealth, lots of talent, what we lack is the ability to connect the wealth and talent to the people who need it. Not to give it away, because we have lots of evidence that giving things away does not change circumstance. Services don't change poverty. What changes poverty is empowerment. So when people have the ability to take control of their lives, to make decisions about the, their life and their circumstances, that's what changes circumstance and makes it possible for people to use education as a means to improve themselves. I believe the work you're doing in, in, in Europe is of critical importance because we need this kind of connection across sectors, across communities, that expand opportunities to individuals that pre presently are cut out, who are presently marginalized by circumstance and for whom we have very little in the way of answers right now. I am uh, impatient about what I see going on. I was asked by Mayor Bloomberg to serve on a commission. Some of you may have heard Mayor Bloomberg and George Soros gave about $30 million to support an initiative for young men of color. And I readily agreed to serve as an advisor on this commission that would see, I thought, have some input how this money would be spent. And then I found out that most of it's going to be spent to supplement programs they've cut. So rather than doing something innovative that would actually expand opportunity, we're just going to keep doing what we've been doing, which already hasn't worked. We suffer from a lack of imagination. My hope is that as you grow as an organization, you'll continue to think about new ways to become even more effective, to connect young people who need it to opportunity, and then to help those that you connect them with to figure out how to work with them and how to make these relationships successful and sustainable. It's not easy work. I'm sure those of you who've been doing it for a long time will know and agree that it's hard work because part of what we have to do is to change the way people think about their circumstances, change the way in which people see each other, that we see beyond race and see beyond class to see potential. Not easy work, but it's work of critical importance. The other day I was uh, asked to speak in uh, Westchester, and so I had to get up very early, and uh, I was living in Washington Heights at the time, and I went to the McDonald's in my neighborhood to get a cup of coffee, about six in the morning. And when I get there, there's uh, a guy who was uh, clearly been up all night, He's still intoxicated from a night of hard partying or whatever he was doing. And he's haranguing a customer. He's on him. I want two dollars, give me two dollars for breakfast. On him, on him, on him. Guy's ignoring him, hoping that he'll just get his food and get out. The guy leaves and the, 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 the guy who's begging turns and looks at me. He looks at me up and down, sizes me up. 
He says, you're OG. For those of you who don't know, OG means original gangster. He said, that's right. He says, uh, what you doing here? In Washington Heights. I said, well, I'm about to go uh, give a lecture. He says, what you do? I said, I'm a professor. He said, you're a professor? And you live here? Professors don't live around here. He said, oh, this one does. He says, who are you going to go talk to? I'm going to go talk to some teachers. He says, teachers? He says, to, his eyes start to bulge. He says, I hate teachers. I said, why do you hate teachers? He says, look at me. He said, I'm out here on the streets. He said, I could have been something. If my teachers had believed in me, I wouldn't be out here now begging for $2. He said, you tell those teachers to teach those kids and believe in them. Give them a chance. Don't write them off. Otherwise, they have to worry about people like me. And please, give me $2 for breakfast. <laughs> I gave him the $2. <laughs> and I told those teachers about it, too. Because we like to take great pride on our success stories, that American dream story. Those who rise up, but guess what? There's a bunch of others out there, too, who could have been an artist, an engineer, who knows, if we found a way to reach them and use education to change the whole orientation, whole trajectory they were on. Europe is focusing on a critical population, that population of disconnected youth, who right now could go either way. And you are setting an example that I hope a whole country will learn from because I think what we suffer from is not only lack of imagination, but a lack of hope. We need to believe it's possible to solve these problems. And I really think even if government can't do it, then we can turn to civil society and find some solutions, find ways to draw on the resources, the talents in our communities to solve those problems. So I appreciate what you do, and I hope that you'll keep doing it Thank you for inviting me tonight.